Okay, Beth, today we are going to talk about this airplane, a marvel of engineering. Now, Marty, I know that two brothers invented this airplane. Who were they? Not who, Wright. Wright? Correct. Yeah, but who invented the airplane? Wright. Let's try this one more time. Two brothers invented the airplane. Who were they? Wright. Wright? Correct. All right, let me try a different approach here. Okay, in 1903, two brothers invented the airplane. Who were they? Right. Who? Right. Right? Correct. Who invented the airplane? Right. Before they built the airplane, did they build anything else? They were bike makers. So they built bikes, right? Correct. Okay. Did they build the whole airplane? The wings, the propeller, the engine? Taylor built the engine. I thought they were bike makers. Right. So you're telling me a Taylor built the engine? Correct. All right, this, this brings me back around to where we started. Who invented the airplane? Right. Right? Correct. Uh, I think you're going to need a little bit more time to talk about this. Uh, right. See, now you're getting it. This, this is, is STEM in 30. This is so wrong. Hi, I'm Marty. And I'm Beth. Today we are coming to you live from the National Air and Space Museum Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia. This place is the home of Space Shuttle Discovery, the SR-71 Blackbird, and the Concorde. But we're not talking about any of those today. Right. 113 years ago today, the Wright brothers uh, made their first attempt at flying the 1903 Flyer. Uh, Wilbur won a, a coin toss. He took off, but things didn't go very well after that. No, four days later, they had fixed all of the damage. Orville climbed on board and made that historic first flight of a heavier-than-air aircraft, and the world really hasn't been the same since. Now, in order to fly a heavier-than-air aircraft, you need an engine. It is, as we said, Taylor built the engine. It wasn't a Taylor, it was Charlie Taylor. And a large part of that engine was, was cast in aluminum, which was made by the predecessor of today's show sponsor, Alcoa. We want to remind you all that you can submit questions on live. We have an expert here who will answer them, and some of them we may even take on the air. We are joined by some great students today from Eagle Ridge Middle School. Thank you guys so much for joining us. They have some amazing, they have some amazing questions to ask today, and a few of them actually got a chance to try their hand at flying a Wright Flyer simulator through the National Air and Space Museum's website, Engineering the Right Way. I'm in Eagle Ridge Middle School, and I'm being joined by some students who are going to step back in time and fly the Wright Flyer, the very first airplane. Now, in order to do that, we're using a website developed at the Smithsonian called Engineering the Right Way. It's going to take you guys through some of the experiments that the Wright brothers did, and it's going to teach you the fundamentals of aeronautical engineering. Are you, are you ready to get going? Yeah. All right, let's go. Engineering the Right Way has six modules, each focusing on a different aspect of the aeronautical engineering system. These guys are designing propellers and engines and gathering data before they go test their designs on the windy hills near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Once they've learned how each piece fits into a complex engineering system, they unlock a 3D simulator where they can try their hand at flying a very accurate model of the Wright's 1903 flyer. Mm -hmm. 
You all have worked through the website and you have unlocked your right flyers and you've been flying them for a bit. Now I'm going to give you a couple of days to practice and then we're going to come back together and we're going to have a little competition live on the air. Who thinks they're going to win? Me. All right. We will get back together in a few days and see who's right. I can't wait to see how they do later. I'm pretty sure they're going to do really, really well. Today we are joined by Dr. Peter Jacob, Chief Curator here at the National Air and Space Museum. Thanks so much for talking with us. It's nice to see you all. We talk a lot about curators, but what exactly is a curator? Well, in a place like this that has historical objects, the curators are historians. And what we do is we use our uh, knowledge about the subject matter to help us decide what objects we bring in the museum, what stories we tell about them, and how we care for them. The Wright brothers looked at the airplane not as individual parts, but more of a system. Why was that so important? Well, if you think about an airplane, it's not just one invention, but it's lots of inventions, all that have to work together to make the airplane fly. And that includes the pilot. The pilot's part of that system as well. And the Wright brothers were really the first to think about an airplane that way, and that's why they leapt ahead of everyone else when they got involved with aeronautics. You've written a lot about the Wright brothers, including a book, uh, Visions of a Flying Machine, which is really good, and I highly recommend it. In that book, you talk about how important the design process is and that they were visual thinkers. Why was that so important? Well, when we think about what engineers do and technical people do, people tend to think, well, okay, they make calculations and they have mathematical formulas to decide what they're going to do. And that's part of it, but it's also a visual thing. When you design something, you have to think about, well, how do the parts fit together and how do they, how do they arrange themselves? And if you think about, say, if you're packing a suitcase or filling your, your, back, your backpack, uh, you, you're seeing your mind's eye. Okay, I'm going to put this thing here, I'm going to put that there, put this on top there. So it's a very visual sort of thing. And that's what inventors do. That's what an engineers do. I never made the connection before between loading the dishwasher and, and the Wright brothers. That's, that's really cool. You ready to take some questions? Sure. All right, let's start with a video question. My name is Emily and my question is, was there a specific mathematical equation they used to determine how to get the plane off the ground? Well, we were just talking about engineers using both mathematics and visual thinking and with regard to the airplane there was a basic equation or basic relationship between things that the Wright brothers used if you need to figure out how much lift you have that's got to be at least as how heavy the airplane is right to lift that into the air you have to have a idea of how uh, your, how big the airplane will be how fast it's going through the air and you can calculate all those things together and figure out exactly what the size and shape and design of the airplane should be. When you think about the Wright brothers, you, you think about builders and, and math doesn't always jump to mind, but it was really important. Well, yeah, we talk about um, the visual thinking part, but they had to calculate uh, exactly how much uh, weight the airplane would be, how fast it was going to go, how big the wings should be. And they, and they used that uh, mathematical skill to figure that out. Wow. All right, let's go to an online question. How many years did it take after the Wright Flyer before people regularly flew in airplanes? Well, the Wright brothers make their first flight in 1903, but it's not until uh, 1905 that they really perfect their design. And in 1908, the time when the airplane behind us was built, uh, they made their first public flights. Uh, so it's really uh, about 10 years or so after the Wright brothers make their first flight that we really start to see airplanes kind of over cities and other places that we regularly see airplanes. So. Uh, it took about 10 years. Awesome. All right, we've got an audience question next. Um, before the Wright brothers, uh, his first airplane, Leonardo da Vinci came up with one of the first gliders. Other than the mechanical aspect of the airplane, what are some differences between the two? Well, the big difference between what Leonardo da Vinci did, who was uh, uh, several hundred years before the Wright brothers, is that da Vinci tried to do everything with one motion. In other words, he was, had a flapping wing machine, and the flapping was going to give lift, was going to give propulsion, was going to help control it. But the Wright brothers realized that you had to separate those things. You had to have a separate lift, separate propulsion, separate control system, because a human being couldn't fly like a bird. We're not strong <laughs> enough to do that. Awesome, good question. All right, let's go back to a video question. My name is Jaden, and my question is, where did the Wright brothers get all their knowledge about aircraft if they didn't finish high school? Well, it is technically true that the Wright brothers didn't finish high school, but that's really kind of a misleading thing. The younger brother, Orville, actually uh, didn't complete his degree because he took a lot of advanced mathematics courses, trigonometry, things like that, in his junior year of high school. So when he went back for his last year, he realized he wasn't going to graduate because he hadn't taken some other required courses. But he had the knowledge he wanted, so he decided not to go back. 
Wilbur actually did complete his high school uh, curriculum, but the family moved away very quickly from where they were living, and he didn't get to go to graduation and get his degree. But even beyond that, the Wright brothers were voracious readers and good self-study uh, people, and they really had an education comparable to a modern college education when they started their work on the airplane. So. Uh, you can follow the example of the Wright brothers, but don't follow their example of not finishing high school. <laughs> All right, well, Beth is joined by a very special guest who has an interesting connection to the Wright brothers. Beth? Thanks, Marty. I am here with Keith York. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Glad now, to you are a relative of the Wright brothers. Now, I know that neither Orville nor Wilbur had any children. So how is it that you are connected to the Wright family? That's right. So Orville and Wilbur actually had two older brothers, uh, Ruchlin and Lauren, who both got married and had kids. And uh, so that's how I'm related. Lauren is actually my great, great grandfather. So. And you just graduated uh, college. Do you want to tell us what you studied? Yeah. So I just graduated this past May from the University of Southern California, uh, where I studied astronautical engineering. And now that's very similar to aerospace or mechanical engineering on, on a lot of the core courses of physics and math, those sorts of courses. But the, where it differs from aerospace is in the last few courses, instead of focusing on flying wings in atmosphere and stuff like that, it focuses a little more on spacecraft dynamics, rocket propulsion, orbital mechanics, things of that nature. I kind of see a theme here. Now, did your relatives influence you? in what you decided to study? Absolutely they did, yeah. Uh, I was fortunate enough in 2003 uh, to be around for the 100th anniversary of the first flight, and I was 13 years old at that age. And so during that time, I got the chance to meet some pioneers like Neil Armstrong and John Glenn. And as a 13-year-old to meet these heroes of humanity, it was really inspirational to see all they'd done. And that kind of set me down the path to stick with STEM and engineering and, and pursue that as not only my education, but as my career as well. Now, is there other connections between Orville and Wilbur that you have in your family, either stories or memorabilia or things that they had? Yeah, uh, on the story side, um, they were both, and Orville in particular was an avid practical joker, would love to pull pranks on uh, the family members and used his engineering skill to do so. Um, from a physical standpoint, I was actually fortunate enough to um, get passed down Orville's uh, NACA badge. Um, and so NACA was the National Advisory uh, Committee on Aeronautics uh, and is the predecessor to what is now NASA. And so they focused more on airfoils and things like that. And when um, we started seeing space travel as, as a possibility, it kind of morphed into NASA. So I really love that I have this badge, which is you know, a connection to the past and also kind of in NASA and what we're looking at and going into space. In and the it, also, it also shows how quickly things moved along after the, it, the invention of the airplane. You go from the invention of the airplane into, you know, NACA, and the person who invented it is still alive and active. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's amazing when with determination and focus in the right areas, how much can get done. And I'm excited to see, you know, in the next 100, 1500 years, some, something like that, where we can go. Okay, well, now Peter and Marty are going to show us a little bit about how to control the plane. We're standing in front of a, a reproduction of the 1908 Wright military flyer, and even though it's different than the 1903, the, the way you control it's fairly similar. How do you control a plane like this? Well, we're going to talk about that, and don't worry, I'm not going to do my Michael Jackson impersonation, but when we're touching an object in the museum, we always have to wear gloves to protect it. So the Wright brothers uh, figured out that an airplane isn't like a car or a boat where it just moves in two dimensions. It actually moves not only this way and this way, but up and down, right, in three dimensions. So they had to come up with a control system to figure out how could they do that. And one of the first things they figured out was how do you balance the wings or control the wings like this and be able to, to turn the airplane. So they came up with this idea that they, where they literally twisted or warped the wings to do that. And I'm going to show you how that act, action works on the airplane here. So if you look at the outer wingtips, you see how they twist up and down. One side goes up, the other side goes down. And if you look on a modern airplane, you can see how there's these movable surfaces on the edge of the wings, right? Well, that's just an evolution of this kind of control. It was just simpler to twist the wing than to make a hinged surface on the early airplanes. So this was how they controlled their airplane to turn it. Now, if you look closely, what else is happening? You see that the rudder of the airplane is also moving when I turn it. And here you can see how the rudder turns back and forth. And that controls the airplane going this way. So we can control the 
airplane and roll like that with the wing warping. We can control it this way with the rudder. And what else do we need to do? We need to go up and down, right? So we need to be able to climb and descend. So we have this device on the front of the airplane, and that's called an elevator. And by moving this up and down, that controls the climb and the descent of the airplane. So well, the Wright brothers had these three controls which allowed the airplane to fly in three axes of motion in three-dimensional space. And that was the key to unlocking airplanes, right? It's the same way that all airplanes fly today. One of the things that's really important to know about the Wright brothers, they weren't just the first people to get off the ground, but their airplane has the same basic controls, the same aerodynamics, the same way of propul propelling itself that all modern airplanes do. Of course, we have jet engines now as well. But the Wright airplane really is the beginning of it all. So it's like, you know, you fly an airplane today, the Wright flyer is a relative of that plane. You're flying the same way the Wright brothers did. <laughs> That's cool. You've probably seen the very famous image of the Wright brothers' first flight. The plane barely taken off the ground, Wilbur running alongside. Well, we had a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Tom Crouch, a Wright brothers expert, for this expert annotation. Hi, my name's Tom Crouch. I'm the senior curator of aeronautics at the National Air and Space Museum. And I've been studying, thinking, reading about, and writing about the Wright brothers for a long time. And here is the famous picture of the world's first airplane just leaving the rail on its first flight. So let's take a look at it. The picture was taken on December 17, 1903. It's about 10.35 in the morning. They're at a place called the Kill Devil Hills, about four miles south of a little fishing village called Kitty Hawk. Now on this first flight, Orville was doing the piloting. He only kept the airplane in the air for about 120 feet, uh, 12 seconds all told. Uh, they made four flights that morning and uh, each one was a little longer than the one before it. By the time it was Wilbur's turn for the fourth flight, he actually flew 852 feet down the beach and he was in the air for 59 seconds. And this is Orville who is laying down on the uh, lower wing. And this is Wilbur who was running alongside the airplane looking kind of surprised. When you look at this photograph of the world's first airplane, what are you really looking at? Well, these two biplane wings, uh, about 40 feet, four inches across, they're covered with unbleached muslin, and you have wood struts. So, if you look at the airplane, there, it doesn't have any wheels. That's because they're gonna fly from sand, then the wheels would sink into the sand. So the notion they came up with was to run the airplane, get flying speed, running down a monorail track. Just a wooden beam on little cross pieces with a metal cap strip. And the airplane runs down the track on this thing, which is a trolley. And when it takes off, the trolley just drops off, so that's where it is. And as you can see from the photograph, that day, the airplane didn't have to run very far down the track to take off. As you can see, it's not even over the end of the track, and it's already in the air. So where did it start? Well, that's kind of neat. If you look back here, you can see the outline of the wing in the sand. Now, how come it's outlined in the sand? Well, before they started the flight, everybody was walking around the airplane, checking things and so on. So where the wing was at the beginning of the flight, they outlined with their feet, which is kind of neat. There you have it. That's kind of deconstructing uh, the photograph of the world's first airplane on its first flight. Well, Keith and I are now joined by some of our students from Eagle Ridge Middle School. And you all have been practicing flying, is that correct? Yes. Are you ready to fly like an eagle? <laughs> yeah. Okay, what is your name? My name's Rhea Sherma. Okay, Rhea, let's get started. Okay. Tell us what you're doing. So, I'm just trying to keep the nose of the plane high so my plane doesn't crash. If you get it too, oh! oh. Out. 
Well, Rhea, you, you went further than the Wright brothers did. Oh. <laughs> All right, let, let's see who's next. Okay, let's set you this up here. And we'll test the flyer again. All right, and you gonna tell me your name? I'm Ryan Rodriguez from oh. Eagle Ridge Middle School. Okay, Ryan, let's go. You're gonna have to tell us what you're doing. Yep. So right now I'm just trying to keep the nose of the plane down. Not too down, but just making sure that I can easily control and... Okay, so you're past 200 feet. All right. And, and you're just controlling the, the yep. nose, right? I'm trying to keep it a bit down so that I can see the shadow of the plane. Okay, you got 400 feet. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, well, you didn't go upside down, so that's, so that's good. Okay, Keith, do you want to see if you can get past yeah. 454 feet? Let's see. Okay, it's, it's all hanging on you, Keith. All right. So, Keith, what are you doing? So, same, same sort of idea, you know, the keeping the elevator and the pitch as level as possible so you don't go too high and stall out or too low and dig into the sand. And this flies very similarly to what uh, Uncle Orv and Uncle Will described uh, the actual O3 flyer to fly like very, uh, a lot of pitch undulation. And that was actually one of their main changes when they moved on to the, to the O5 flyer and had like the first practical airplane was to uh, move the elevator a little further out to provide a little more stability and control. And Are you going to land. land, nice landing? Oh, no, no, apparently not. Set her down for a oh, nice gosh. landing. <laughs> landing seems to be difficult. Landing is not the easiest part. Good, good move on their part to do it in sand. Oh, <laughs> and you crashed it yeah, as well. Yeah, I crashed too. <laughs> well, Marty and I also had a chance to uh, test this simu simu simulator. Let's see how we did. Farther than the rights, still in the air, 150 feet. Not doing well. Farther than the right. Oh, crashing! Oh, flipped! No! Oh. <laughs> I have never flipped it upside down. You're dead, buddy. <laughs> That's not, that is not good. <laughs> that is not good. <laughs> so you're saying that this is engineering the wrong way. In my defense, I did fly further than the Wright brothers. I just had a little trouble with the, the landing. But the Wright brothers actually put a big emphasis on them knowing how to fly, didn't they? Oh, absolutely. As we talked about earlier, they saw the airplane as a system, as many things having to work together. And the pilot was one of those. In fact, their first uh, craft was not even an airplane. It was a kite, which they used to develop their control system. But then they built three gliders, three full-size gliders, before they built that powered airplane from 1903. And not only were they refining the design, but they were also teaching themselves how to fly. So when they got on that airplane in 1903, they were already pilots. You ready to take some more questions? Sure. All right, let's go to a video question. Hi, I'm Ashley. Why didn't the Wright brothers use another engineer's plane and engine design and just tweak them? Well, you know, the Wright brothers, like all good engineers, when they started their work, they looked around to see what others had done before them and they were surprised to see how little work had been done on aeronautics. A lot of people had been working on it, but not with a lot of success. So when they first started, they really kind of had to sort through all the problems themselves, and they really did invent the airplane in a more original way than most inventions. Almost everything about the airplane was their idea. Wow. All right, let's go to an online question. How have the planes of today improved upon the Wright brothers' original flyer? Well, in very simple terms, modern airplanes are just like the Wright brothers' airplane. The control system is the same, the aerodynamics are the same, so obviously we have different materials, they're made out of metal, they go faster, we have jet engines now, but basically the airplane, the, way, the type of airplane that you fly in when you go off on vacation somewhere is exactly the same kind of airplane that the Wright brothers built back in 1903. Wow. All right, we've got an audience question, come on up. At the time when the Wright brothers were designing their first airplanes, um, wind tunnels were at very primitive stages. So how did, they, how did the Wright brothers modify the wind tunnels so they could successfully test their designs? That's a really smart question. He's asking about the wind tunnel. And the Wright brothers uh, created a wind tunnel 
and what was special about it, it wasn't just putting a shape of an airplane wing in there and kind of watching what it does. They actually designed some instruments to get some information to design the airplane. Earlier we talked about their formula for calculating the size and weight of the airplane. Well, they were looking for one of the uh, uh, terms in that equation, and with their wind tunnel, they were actually able to design the airplane. So the Wright brothers not only got the first airplane off the ground, but they really invented aeronautical engineering. Wow. All right, let's go to a video question. Hi, my name is Charles, and my question is, are there any materials that were used in the Wright brothers' plane that are used today? Uh, he talked about materials, and the, air, the Wright brothers' airplanes were made of wood, and they were covered with a muslin fabric. Uh, most airplanes today are made out of metal, but we still have some airplanes that have a wooden fabric, uh, a wooden frame, and a wooden uh, a fabric covering on them. Uh, but uh, uh, designs have changed a bit. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today, Peter. I'd like to also thank Keith and our sponsor for today's show, show the Alcoa Foundation. Be sure to tune in next month as we look at the biology of long-term space flight. Check this out. This is a full-scale model of Ham the first chimpanzee in space. The real Ham is buried right here at the New Mexico Museum of Space History. Ham helped pave the way for humans to go to space. Back then, we didn't know how the human body was gonna react being in space. We didn't know if the brain would function. We didn't know if we'd be able to swallow. There were so many unanswered questions. There are still unanswered questions about human travel in space, especially long duration space flight. If you want to learn about the biology of long-term space flight, be sure to tune in to STEM in 30. Peter, did the Wright brothers ever fail? Well, all inventors have their ups and downs, and just as anyone else, the Wright brothers did too. Probably the low point in their work was in 1901 when they were flying their second glider, and it wasn't performing anywhere near as well as they thought it was supposed to. And when they were on their way back uh, from Kitty Hawk back to their home in Dayton, Ohio, uh, they almost gave up, but very quickly they regained their enthusiasm and moved on to success. Awesome, and failure is an important part of the learning process. We've had a chance to talk to some really cool people about the importance of failure, so stick around after the credits. We have a short video talking about that, how important failure is. And we will leave you today with some video of a reproduction of the right flyer uh, from the right experience actually taking to the air. Thanks for watching. You know, there is a phrase at NASA um, that failure is not an option. And I absolutely agree with that. But I think that uh, we need to add failure is not an option, it is a necessity. We spend an incredible amount of time uh, in simulators, practicing launch and entry in our emergency procedures for launch and re-entry in the Soyuz. And we fail. We have a fire and we don't do the right thing. So then we get the simulator ready again and we try again. And we fail and we pick ourselves back up and try again. When we say failure is not an option, it's a necessity. We're talking about the type of failure where we're testing ourselves, where we're reaching beyond our boundaries. We're trying new things. Not the type of failure where you're not trying hard enough. You're not doing your homework where you're blowing things off. We're talking about the failure um, where you are pushing yourself and trying new things and to not be afraid of that failure, but figuring out how to deal with it and, uh, and picking yourself up and using the lessons that you learned from that failure to make yourself better and to apply those to the next challenge. For Apollo 13, when we had three astronauts on their way to the moon and they suffered a catastrophic failure to their spacecraft, because the team had trained so much, both on the ground and in space, when the time came that failure was not an option, the team knew how to deal with it. They knew how to recover, and they knew how to get those astronauts 
back home safely. Failure is a tough thing to experience, but it's absolutely critical to future success. I've experienced failure plenty of times. Matter of fact, I love to fail. Why do I love to fail? Because that's where I learned my greatest lessons, not from my success, but how to be better, how to be efficient. In addition to that, how to be creative. Failure to me is the greatest asset that I have as a human being. I can go back to when I was in fourth grade and I was a real nerd, I can say for sure. And my father was in the military, so we moved around. And I was always used to being in the top reading group. And I remember I showed up in my new fourth grade and the teacher put me in the B reading group. And I remember being just, you know, coming home, tell my mom she had to go in and talk to the teacher. My mom, of course, said no. And I realized, nope, you had to just prove that you belonged in the A reading group. So that was like one of my first uh, failures. And then the other time that I failed that was probably the most difficult was when I applied to medical school. The first time I wound up um, going, um, getting on the waiting list at UCLA. I was kind of devastated. The next year I got in and then it turned out that that year that I didn't get into medical school, I was a TA in chemistry. I wound up getting my master's in chemistry and then when NASA came along and selected people to be mission specialists, that was what they were looking for. People that had a major area but also knew something about another area of science. So I had a degree in medicine and a, back, a minor kind of in, in chemistry. So what was a failure at that time later turned out to, to be very helpful. So I think you wind up looking back, learning more from your failures than your successes, and sometimes unexpectedly wind up benefiting you. You know, all of us experience failure. And uh, I think the way to recover from it is to, one, catch your breath and recognize that everybody is going to fail and you need to look at what the recovery path is. And so I, that's always been my focus. When I've had some, some particularly bad moments, I've looked at what the next step is to get back on track, and that's served me well. Have I ever experienced failure? Almost definitely. Uh, I think you never learn stuff unless you fail. I think one of the greatest things that I've done in my life is failed at everything. Um, you know, when I was putting together my first, uh, you know, when I, when I first started playing with my hands and taking things apart, there would be extra parts. And I didn't understand why. And I actually learned a lot by failing. I mean, I don't think you actually learn by succeeding. So if you've never failed a test or if you've never actually uh, gotten a bad grade, it's probably not the best thing for you because you're like, oh, I know how to do this. When you really learn, when you really grow is when you fail and you see, oh, these are the things I don't know how to do. And so one of the greatest things in my life has been the failures that I've had and how I pick myself back up and how I ask myself, okay, what did I do wrong and how do I fix it so that I don't do that same mistake again? And I think that's the most important thing is to don't give up, but keep trying to figure out what happened and then don't make the same mistake twice. That's very important. Failure is an important part of growing, of experimenting and learning. Assuming, assuming you pick the right things to give yourself the latitude to fail at and are very careful with the big important things. But failure allows you to, to learn um, from what you did wrong, what you would do differently, and figure out kind of what your strengths and weaknesses are. And um, it's the coming back from failure, I think, that makes all of us stronger. And it also shows us that we're trying as hard as we can and reaching and experimenting as much as we might want to or be able to. I feel if I'm not failing at points in my life or with things that I do, it means I'm not trying enough things. I have experienced failure many times and I think that it's important to move on and learn from that. Um, one example I can think of is that I took a job once that I thought sounded great and then in the end I realized it wasn't quite the right fit for what I was looking for and I ended up leaving that job after only six months and in a lot of ways I felt like a failure. I felt like I was quitting um, but in the end and in retrospect I realized that recognizing that that wasn't quite the right path. It was close and I thought it was right, um, but being willing to move on and accept that I had maybe m made a wrong turn turned out to be really important and really instrumental. So I think failures actually can always be reframed. It's kind of like a negative result in science. Finding out that you don't want to do something sometimes can be just as important as finding out that you do want to do something.